itself held just outside the capital, Stockholm. After our report on the Masters Rally, we go to England for a round of the Marlborough Formula 3 Championship Series and then back to Sweden for the 11th round of the World Road Racing Championship for 250, 500cc bikes and of course the final round of the Sidecar World Championship. But first of all, back to Sweden and back to one of the most prestigious events to be held in that country and covered exclusively of the world. Of course, World Rally Championship, often covered here on Sky Channel's International Motorsports program. On the left, we see Bjorn Valdegard, his co-driver, being introduced to the King of Sweden. Bjorn, who is well known, of course, driving the Toyota, and Stig Blomqvist and Bjorn Sederberg. Two favourites with the crowd should be the works Toyota Celica Turbos for the man who won the Safari Rally at his very first attempt. You are Kankanen, seen here, and of course his teammate Bjorn Voldegaard. We spoke to Bjorn before the rally. Bjorn Voldegaard, a good drive in the Thousand Lakes, now you're competing here in Sweden. How do you think this event will go? You know, this is a complete different event. It's very short, it's only for one day and uh, mostly for publicity and the possibility of uh, people in Stockholm area to see a proper rally. Team Toyota Europe must consider this event important to send both you and Jura Kankinen. I think all teams uh, start to see this kind of uh, activities or rallies important for uh, as you see today it's a lot of people around and uh, it's a good chance to what to say expose yourself and your rally car and the sport what is not uh, to forget. There's some very tough competition here. How do you think you'll go? It's always tough. And even if it's a short rally, it's uh, as tough as ever. So it will be a good competition and I will be fighting for a good result. One of the most spectacular cars on the recent Valley of the Thousand Lakes was the brand new Audi Quattro the Evolution version called the S1. It's been entered here for 1984 world champion Stig Blomqvist. Stig, you're competing here in the new Evolution Sport Quattro. How does that differ from the last uh, Sport Quattro? Uh, this one is much better. It's big, big difference. So for us now, it's a big step forward. Do the new aerodynamics help very much? Yes, because people are laughing at it, but it helps very, very much. Now, it looks more like a racer than a rally car, but it certainly seems to go. Ah, it's going very well, especially in high speed. It's fantastic, really. What about the competition here? Most of the top drivers are here. Oh, okay, it's quite a lot of top drivers here, so it can be quite tough even here. And why do you compete in this event? I don't know, but it's nearly the only chance for me to do anything in Sweden, and okay, it's quite interesting to do something there in Sweden well, because you have lived here so long time and so it's the only chance to do anything here. And so to the International Masters Rally itself, an event held over five special stages. Each of the stages will be run several times in different directions, but the whole event being compacted into the afternoon of Saturday the 31st of August. There is a large crowd of spectators numbering something like six or seven thousand that have come to see what really should be ranking as one of the major motorsporting events in Sweden, along of course with the Swedish International Rally that takes place every February, an event that you can see covered in 1986 here on the Sky Channel. First through is Bjorn Voldegaard with his works Toyota Celica Turbo. And on this first stage, he'll be sixth quickest. Also sixth quickest on the second special stage. And moving up to be third quickest on the third special stage. Then comes Ingvar Kalfsson with the BMW 323. Normally we see Ingvar in the World Rally Championship in a Mazda RX-7. But as you can see, he's working pretty hard with the BMW. <laughs> it 
sometimes a little bit too hard. By promoter Chris Billstrom. And as you can see, most of it on gravel and loose surface roads. Next through will be one of the most spectacular drivers that we'll probably be seeing in this report, Ewer Kankinen, with the second of the Toyota Samika Turbos, finished driver. The one, as we said, the Safari Rally on his very first attempt, tipped by many to be a future world champion. Ewer will be third quickest on the first special stage, fourth quickest on the second, and fourth quickest also of the third. So it looks as if Cam Finnan will be the leading two-wheel drive exponent, as it were. Next through will be the Works Opel Manta 400 of the West German driver Erwin Weber. Another leading rally driving exponent, although of course uh, he's quite well known for rally raids. He also led the Safari Rally before the Opel. Well, <laughs> this man is certainly very spectacular. Number 23 is Anders Johnson with the Opel Escona 400. And he is trying extremely hard, as we now see. And uh, doing a bit of two-wheel driving. Someone should really tell him that uh, stunt work is not part of rallying. But still, it's all very good value for the spectators. So, Anders Jonsson just about survives that corner. As we wait for the next car to come through. Number 24 for Naila Johansson. in the Opel Cadet GSI. And this number 25 is Acer Cotola with the Audi 80 Quattro, the four-wheel drive version. The Audi Quattro was Harry O. Solberg, number 27. And he's trying hard. Next up will be no less than Gunnar Peterson with his Audi 80 Quattro. Of course, he'll be having quite a battle with his arch rival, as we said before, Michael Eriksson. This man, Gunnar Peterson, who won the Group A category in the 1985 Swedish International Rally. And then he had that close battle with Michael Eriksson. After some three special stages, it will be Michael Eriksson who is leading his private battle ahead of Gunnar Peterson. Just ten seconds in it between the two Audi Quattro 80s. Next up is Jens Ola Christensen with the Peugeot 205 Turbo. This is one of the 200 cars made for the homologation purposes, driven by the Dane. We've seen Jens Ola Christensen with the Peugeot in the recent Limburgia Rally in Holland, number 29. A car similar to that driven by Ari Vatman at the beginning of the year. And next up will be Pierre Eklund. Certainly one of the favourites for this International Masters Rally Sprint. The Swede, who is Audi Quattro A2, the older version, of course, of the S1 before the Evolution version. And Pierre Eklund determined to do well here in front of his own home crowd. He'll be seated just in front of Stig Blomqvist with the works car. Here with the Clarion sponsored Audi Quattro. We've seen him 
the British Open Rally Series, of course, driving a Toyota. And through now comes the car that everybody has really been waiting for, the Audi Sport Quattro S1. The all thinking, all dancing, all monster Audi Quattro. And sure enough, on the first two special stages, it was to be Steve Longfist who was to be quickest and lead the field by some 12 seconds ahead of Pierre Eklund, who in turn was some 13 seconds ahead of Ewa Kankinen. But on the third special stage, both Pierre Eklund and Stig Blomqvist actually tied for quickest time. So certainly Pierre Eklund putting up quite a fight against his fellow Swede. It's amazing just how uh, monstrous this Audi Quattro looks when you compare it to the nice, uh, quiet, as it were, Peugeot of the works teams that we've seen in the World Rally Championship Series. Another spectacular driver is Max Jonsson with his Opel Ascona 400 and he in fact will complete the runners on this International Masters Rally Sprint. Max Jonsson, who after two special stages, do well actually, he's lying in seventh place overall, car number 32. So halfway through the event, we have Stieg Blomqvist who leads from Pierre Eklund with Ewa Kankinen in third place, but the time's still pretty close, no more than 25 seconds covering the top three. Well, for uh, spectators, there's plenty of side attractions such as the parachute jumping. And both of them down safely, not far away from their marker. Now, oh, what a way to drop in for a rally sprint. Good weather conditions, it's not raining, nice and dry, which of course has attracted a very large crowd here to this major event. The whole of the International Masters Rally Sprint is in fact held on a military training ground and for the spectators and a static display of the various military vehicles, which incidentally are not entered for the competitive part of the event. But it's an ideal area to hold such an international event. In fact, very similar, of course, to the real peace idea. So now through comes number one, Bjorn Voldegaard, once again. Bjorn, who now after four special stages, will be in fourth spot, some seven seconds behind Ewa Kankinen. He's third. It's really the battle between these top four. And Valdegard going through to ultimately finish in fourth place overall. Next through, once again, is Ingvar Carlsen with the BMW 323. And despite his car being rather underpowered, Ingvar has done extremely well and will finish in tenth place overall. And that's pretty good, considering uh, it's not a works car or anything like that. And that's pure driving technique. And here we see, in slow motion again, Ingvar Carlsen hanging his front wheel there over the ditch. Down it goes. Well, uh, that's using up every inch of the uh, gravel road and just that little bit more well with the car he'll finish in 11th place as up comes Ewa Kankinen. Now Ewa Kankinen was quickest on the fourth special stage. In fact there were three cars all with exactly the same time on that fourth special stage. Kankinen, Pierre Eklund and Stig Blomqvist and that really is a measure of the way that Kankinen can drive to be able to equal the time set by the four-wheel drive out of Quattro's. And Kankinen will, in fact, ultimately finish in third place overall. So Toyotas will finish third and fourth, but of course Kankinen will win the two-wheel drive section, as it were. Erwin Weber with the Opel Manta 400, the works car, number seven. Surprisingly, he will only finish in seventh place. Normally expect uh, the Opel to be a little bit quicker than that. But still, 
I'm in favour with the Opal there. Let's see how he takes this corner. Doesn't cut it quite as much as we saw the BMW of Ingvar Carlsen do. Next up is Susan Kotolinski with the large Volvo. And she'll finish in 22nd place. Obviously, uh, she's doing it just for the enjoyment. Next up is uh, Mina Salankova with her Mazda RX-7. And she'll finish in 19th spot. Number 20 did finish, finished last, at least he finished. That's Anders Kjellstrom. And these three must be the most ungainly cars for rallying. Next up is then Eric Eriksson with his Ford Escort. Number 21. And he finishes in an excellent ninth place overall. So that's a very good effort from Ericsson with the Ford Escort 2000. Next up will be number 22 Bjorn Blomqvist with his little Golf GTI. Now Bjorn has really had quite an exceptional event because he'll finish in 13th place overall, equaling the time of last Eric Torp. Now Eric Torp, as we know, is a very experienced rally driver in Group A, and so Bjorn Blomqvist can be well pleased with his achievement here at the International Masters Rally Sprint. Next through is the ever spectacular Anders Jonsson, number 23. But being spectacular doesn't necessarily make you quick, because after the five special stages, he'll be in 18th place overall. Still, he makes good television. <laughs> Obviously, when he sees the TV camera here from the Sky Channel, he tries even harder. Number 26 coming through is Roger Ericsson with the little Subaru. And he'll finish in 16th place overall. That's another good effort. What is basically an underpowered car. And there the car being driven to its absolute limit. Number 27 is next, Cario Solberg with his Audi Quattro. Finnish driver finishing in 15th place with the privately entered four-wheel drive Audi Quattro, taking things relatively easy. One man most certainly not taking things easy is this man, Gunnar Peterson. Incredibly, after the four special stages, he was just one second adrift from Michael Erickson. So it was all down to the fifth and final stage, and plenty for him of 10 tenths driving. But ultimately, he was to have exactly the same time on this fifth and final stage as Michael Erickson. So Erickson won the battle by just one second, finishing in fifth place overall. And the Dane goes through, that is Jens Ola Christiansen, with his four-wheel drive turbocharged Peugeot. But he was taking things relatively easy with this Group B car, finishing only in 21st place. Let me repeat that Michael Erickson was to finish in fifth place overall, just one second clear of Gunnar Peterson and win basically the Group A category. Next up, Pierre Eklund. Eklund knowing that he had to pull out all the stops over these final two special stages to get up and try and take the lead away from the 1984 world champion Stig Blomqvist. As we've heard on special stage four, Kankinen, Blomqvist and Eklund were all equal quickest. But ultimately, Per Eklund was to finish in second spot to Stig Blomqvist, just 14 seconds adrift from the ex-world champion, who was here to win the International Masters Rally Sprint for 1985 with the works Audi Quattro. With Aerofoil's front and back, this really does look like the most spectacular of rally cars that we've seen for many years. So Blomqvist there, number 31, 
the winner of the International Masters Rally Sprint from Pier Eklund by some 14 seconds. And there finally through comes number 32, Mats Jonsson. He's to finish in eighth place overall. Mats Jonsson, another driver well known to British enthusiasts. And of course, uh, they'll all be coming over for the final round of the World Rally Championship, the RAC Rally of Great Britain that we'll be reporting in great detail here on Sky Channel. So, a very successful event and victory for Stig Blomqvist from Sweden. An event organised, we said, by the Klaus Bilston marketing company. And there, Stig Blomqvist up to receive his prize, and we spoke to him after the ceremony. Stig, a good win today here against some great competition. How was the rally? Ah, it was a good rally. Um, okay, the competition, what you said, is quite hard, but okay, I think my car is a little bit better than the other cars just now here, because it was not that hard really, but okay, it's a good competition anyway. No problems at all with the car? No, not at all. It was just to go quite sensible and try to stay on the road. Thanks, Stig. Thank you. So an excellent international masters rally sprint. Stig Blomqvist and co-driver Bjorn Sederberg winning by 14 seconds. Kankinen third, Valdegard fourth. Michael Eriksson winning from Gunnar Peterson by just one second. The Group A battle and they continuing their battle but they started in February. One, of course, is Spectator Day, when the special stages are carefully selected in uh, public parks and uh, stately homes to allow the spectators to see the cars and the stars. Typical of them was special stage one at Badminton, 1.9 miles of narrow tarmac across the parkland, but in this rain, very slick indeed, and with lots of tricky bends. There could hardly have been a less friendly start at a rally than at Badminton. 
The rain made the famous eventing venue even more treacherous than anticipated. And world champion Timo Salonen was quickly showing his sideways cross-country skills. But it was the second man, Stig Blomqvist, who set the pace in the Ford RS200. Stig is the only past winner in the event, and he set an uncatchable time of 2 minutes, 9 seconds. Marco Alain just has to do well in this rally to keep his championship chances alive. But the Rosberg of rallying was soon sliding haplessly over the grass. There were 10,000 hardy spectators here to see the stars in action and they were rewarded with this full focus spin by Callie Grunville in the Ford. There wasn't much breathing space between badminton and the next Parkland stage, one of nine to be held on this slippery Sunday, covering over 27 miles. Stig Blomqvist led the rally from Salonen and Kankunen as he started a three-mile mixed-surface Sirencester test, but this time he had to settle for fourth place behind three of the sure-footed Peugeots. The 27-year-old world championship leader Kankunen, winner of three rallies already this year, was in flying form. He was four seconds faster than any of his rivals and led the rally by six seconds on the way to Sutton Park. But there was no joy for Harry Teumann, the younger brother of last year's winner, the late and much-missed Henry Teumann. Harry lost his metro right in front of our cameras and had to go back and start again. He told us, at least I was lucky, I didn't hit anything. the rally headed up the motorway to the Midlands. This is a lady driver, Louise Aitken Walker, who was discovered by a Ford Find a Lady Driver scheme. On her way to Sutton Park, which is always one of the most popular stages and attracts huge crowds. Unfortunately, the rains came again as Salonen splashed through the park, lying fourth. Tony Pond was earning the cheers of the 11,000 crowd. He was fifth fastest and fifth overall. Can he repeat his third place of last year? Cancunan had to settle for second best here, but held his overall lead. Callie Grundle was a long way behind team leader Blomquist. He was seven seconds slower here. Mikhail Eriksson was putting up a powerful performance. But the star here was Mikhail Sunderstrom, fastest by three seconds. There were 12,000 spectators waiting for the leaders at Chatsworth, the sixth stage. 3.56 miles of a narrow, slippery test. Stig Blomquist was really on song. He moved into second place here with a fourth fastest time, and Sundstrom slipped to third, three seconds behind him. Tony Pond has decided he might quit rallying soon. Let's hope not. He was superb here, third quickest and still fourth overall. Kankanen, still complaining of petrol fumes, was fastest to keep his lead by 11 seconds over Blomquist. As the sun set over Chatsworth, Mikhail Eriksson entered the stage in seventh place, desperate for a vital top three placing. But this incident didn't help him. He dropped a place, but he didn't drop into the lake. So at the end of the first day, Kankanen has just got his nose in front of his arch rival Marco Allen in the Lancia. Pondy is tucked in third place in the Metro. Behind him, Stig Blomquist in the Ford RS200. And then in fifth place, Timo Salonen, the reigning world champion, in another Peugeot. So four different makes of cars in the top five. Only on special stage number five, the petrol cap was open, and about five litres of petrol came into the car. And, and that was quite bad because we had to stop 200 before, metres before the finish open the doors to get some air there, because I couldn't even see the road anymore, but after that it's gone well. And waiting for tomorrow when we see the proper stages. The first proper forest stage of the rally was Stang near Scotch Corner. 
Timo Salonen has not had the best of years as world champion with just one win in his native Finland. But he was in great form here, two seconds faster than any other driver with a 3 minute 25 second time. Malcolm Wilson seemed at home on this bumpy forest stage. He promoted himself to 7th place overall with a 3 minute 27 second flyer. Steve Blomquist changed a turbo on his Ford RS200 before starting the stage and then proceeded to thank the Ford mechanics with a time of 3 minutes 28 seconds. Kankkonen increased the gap over Marco Alain here. He was 3 seconds faster than Alain's Lancia. Mikhail Eriksson was another scorching Scandinavian. His time of 3 minutes 28 seconds moved him into 6th place overall. Kali Grundl has given the Ford team their best placing this year, third in Sweden. He put up one of his best times here and put himself back on the leaderboard in 10th place. Jimmy McRae was obviously looking forward to arriving in his native Scotland in a strong position. You can just see the enthusiasm as he holds on to ninth place with another great time here, ninth fastest. Marco Alain has only had one win since 1984 at San Remo, but he has stayed faithful to Lancia and always gives good value. Tony Pond was really fighting back in the Metro. He remains one of the nimblest and the neatest drivers. Just watch his style here as he clocked 10th equal fastest time. One of the great qualities of the Lombard RSC is the sheer range of drivers it pulls in, from the crack international stars to two Bradford policemen in a rebuilt larder, for example. It's a sort of rallying mecca. It pulls them in from all over the world. Sue Baker managed to catch up with one of them, a New Zealander called Tony Teasdale, in for the first time, driving a Metro 6R4. Tony, your first RAC and a bit of a change from your native New Zealand. How are you finding it? Well, I'm finding it a bit hard to come to grips with, actually, but uh, nevertheless, we knew it would be difficult, so uh, we're just trying to keep a, a reasonable sort of a pace that's safe. So uh, most of what we want to be at the end, and we figure it's still possible to be there in a reasonable place. So. Uh, when we feel a bit more confident, we'll go a bit faster, hopefully. <laughs> Are you finding some of the stages rather tough? Uh, they're not tough, but they're just different. And uh, you never quite know what's the next corner, of course, so you um, have to be a little bit more careful. What's the knack to being quick on this type of terrain with the 6R4? Well, I think the, the difference for me is that I own this car, and uh, it's cost us a lot of money to be here, so we have to have something to show for it at the end, so we're not too interested in rolling into the trees. So. I suppose our approach is a bit different from the works drivers in that respect. Um, I've got to sell this at the end of the day. What do you reckon it's cost you as a private entrant to do this rally? I don't know. I'll find out when I get home. <laughs> unless the bank manager rings me first. The fourth stage of the day took the cars into Walk Forest for the 6.85 mile Shepherd Shield stage. Timo Salonen had dropped to sixth place after Hamsterley. He climbed back to fifth place after this stage where he was again the fastest. Stig Blomquist has suffered a puncture at Hamsterley and he was now lying way back in ninth place. Tony Pond was fifth fastest on this stage, but the Metro was still back in tenth position. Marco Alain was only 10th fastest here and was now 27 seconds behind Cantona. Kelly Grandel was improving all the time, 9th fastest here and 8th overall. Juha Kankinen was consolidating his lead, 2nd fastest here and seemingly totally untroubled. 
The performance of the day at this point was undoubtedly young Ericsson, now lying third overall, but chased strongly by Malcolm Wilson. The thousands who flocked to Kielder Forest saw the rally reach crunch point in more ways than one. There were punches and spins galore, which saw Salonen emerge, sharing the lead with Marco Elaine. Tony Pond accelerated back to eighth place. Just look at Marco Elaine happily sharing the lead. Kelly Grundle somehow kept the Ford in ninth place despite a puncture. But poor old Kankanen had a nightmare, dropping back to third place. Ericsson holding fourth place. Stig Blomquist now fifth. Watch Carlson's Group A Master, now a tremendous tenth. Michael Sundstrom was sixth. And here comes Jimmy McRae, heading to Scotland in seventh place in the Metro. So at the end of the second day, 22 stages run, here's what the top five looked like. We've got a new leader, Mikhail Eriksson, the young Swede in the Lancia. Behind him, absolutely neck and neck, Timo Salonen and Marco Alen. Hotly pursued by Juha Kankanen, then in fifth place, Michael Sundström, in another Peugeot. There were two hours of gentle trundling before the drivers were plunged back into the forest in the Scottish lowlands. Overnight leader Mikhail Eriksson had told us there are too many bends ahead and too many good drivers behind to think of a victory yet. And sure enough, the lead began to seesaw as soon as the quick Scandinavian quintet reached the forests of Craig and Castellora to start the day in earnest. Timo Salonen in the Peugeot started the day two seconds behind Eriksson, but was soon to find himself threatened by his Peugeot teammate Kankanen and the Lancia star Marco Elaine. He was fourth after these two stages. Juha Kankanen had a puncture at Craig, yet still set past this time. He had built up a nine-second lead over Ericsson by the time he emerged from the Castle Oa stage. There were problems at Craig, though, for Ingvar Carlsen, who was not only leading Group A, but had started a day in 17th place. The intercooler split on his master, and he lost 50 seconds to his arch rival for Group A honours, Lassie Lumpy in the open. This is 30-year-old Kenneth Ericsson in his Volkswagen Golf GTI. Already a world record holding motorcyclist, he proved here why he had become the first Group A world champion on four wheels. Despite all her problems on the first day, Louise Aitken Walker was still going well in her Nissan 240RS. She was lying 25th overall, 1 minute 46 seconds ahead of her lady rival, Suzanne Kotolinski. They call this car the surprising Skoda. But perhaps it was no surprise that Ladislav Krecek was leading his class. The team are aiming for their incredible 14th consecutive class win in this round. At this stage, he was 26th overall. Twiglees was the third forest stage of the day. It offered hazards of gravel, 
fire breaks and narrow bridges. But Mikael Eriksson was fourth fastest over the 6.23 miles. Timo Salonen was the quickest here, averaging just over 60 miles an hour, two seconds faster than his closest rival, Kankaman. Marco Ulle, still in third place overall, but he could only manage seventh fastest time, eight seconds slower than the leading Peugeot. This is Michael Sundstrom, popularly known as Mickey Finn. He was ninth equal with Blomqvist at this stage. Jimmy McRae and Tony Pond were chasing each other through the forest in six and seven spots. They would share fifth equal time here. But no wonder the Finns were doing well. The wet, greasy conditions were reminiscent of the Thousand Lakes Travel. This is typical Tony Pond in action. Chris Lord, you had an exciting uh, day yesterday, we read. Well, it's been exciting straight from the word go, actually, Tony. We had a major off on Siren Sester Park, the second stage, which dropped us down to 80 seconds. We gradually climbed up to the start to 40 seconds yesterday morning and decided to just keep on trucking. Um, and then we came across young Mr. Wilson, parked up at the side of one of the Kielder stages. This is when Malcolm Wilson went off. Yeah, it was off and it didn't look too bad enough. And I figured three or four minutes would probably uh, be all it would take to get him back on. Unfortunately, it took ten. Uh, we couldn't get the tow rope on and then this car stalled and we had to push start it and what have you. But once you're into it, you've got a commitment. You can't very well say, well, tough, you know, maybe somebody else will stop. But I'm delighted that it's still going. Hello, Ken. Hi. Uh, Enjoying it? Yeah, great. Those last three stages were tremendous. Twig leads especially. It's uh, fantastic. A Any problems at all? Yesterday I had a little indiscretion and uh, bent the suspension and uh, the front wing a little bit, but it didn't cost us too much time. And John St. these merry men got it going again, so uh, no trouble. Are you? Uh, do you feel tired? No, no not at all. It's a, piece, a lot easier than last year. Not a piece of cake, but it's a lot easier than last year. Very fresh. The Kershoff and Lowther stages brought snow, but also dramatic changes. Ericsson retook the lead here. He was five seconds faster than any other driver, but just look at the conditions. But Sweden's Stig Blomqvist was about to run out of luck. At the end of the Kershoff stage, his engine was smoking, and he would walk sadly out of Lowther his rally over, so there'll be a new name on the cup. In contrast, Jimmy McRae was going splendidly. He was fastest on the roads he knows so well, and emerged from Lyre the fifth overall in his metro. Tony Pond was not enjoying himself. Six miles from the end of the Kershope stage, a front differential broke, and he dropped down to eighth place. Day glow in the forest as Russell Brooks still pounds on in his Opal Mantle. Let's take a look for a moment at the Group A battle. Ingvar Carlsen, the master, was struggling to make up for his early problems. Now he found himself 23 seconds behind his fiercest rival, Lassie Lampi, in the Audi Quattro. With up on the edge of Lake Bassenthwaite, offered a three-mile challenge with some chilling fresh air corners. After all the dramas, it began to look as if Mikhail Eriksson, second fastest here, would finish another day at the top of the leaderboard. World champion Timo Salonen was a full four seconds slower than Eriksson here, but still holding third place. Marco Alain in the Lancy was sensational four seconds faster than any other driver. Kankunen had his hairiest moment of the day, teetering on the edge of disaster with some incredible two-wheel driving. He was still third fastest on this stage. Mikhail Sundstrom is once again amongst the pacemakers, proving he can handle the extra power of the full works car. Stig Blomqvist's sad departure left Callie Grundle to carry the Ford flag. He consolidated his sixth place with an excellent time here at Widow. 
Welshman David Llewellyn was moving up the leaderboard too. Ninth passes on this stage, he was now ninth overall. Another Welshman going well was Glyn Jones in the Opal Nanta. He finished 18th last year at his first attempt and was again 18th at the end of this stage. The two Grisdale forest stages would take the crews from Lake Coniston to Lake Windermere, but there would be little time for sightseeing. Michael Eriksson was soon in trouble. He shot off a bend and hit a tree, severely damaging the front of the car and affecting its steering. He was soon off the road again and limped out of the Grisdale stages down in third place. Timo Salonen had no such misfortune. He clocked a scorching seven minutes, four seconds to leapfrog back to the head of the rally. So at the end of the third day, 32 stages run, this is what the top five looked like. In fact, it's the same five slightly reshuffled. Timo Salonen has charged into the lead, hotly pursued by Marco Allen. Ericsson has stepped back a little into third place in the second Lancia. Juha Kankinen's in fourth place. No doubt glad to be there after his terrible role in Grisdale. And Michael Sundstrom is hanging on to fifth place. <laughs> The Welsh forest of Penmachno did little for the tourist image. It was very wet, very slippery, and there were some big, threatening drops. By the time the survivors reached this hilly stage, Timo Salon was still leading Marco Elaine by eight seconds. Mikael Eriksson was third overall, fastest of the two Klakainon stages. Juha Kankanen was nearly a minute behind his championship rival Elaine. Mikhail Sundstrom was now in sixth place in his Persia. Tony Pond had been fastest on the fourth Glockinog stage and was third fastest here. Callie Grundle had gearbox problems but was still in seventh place. Daylight would bring faster times, of course. And Jimmy McRae accused the organisers of moving the water from stage to stage. Per Eklund was the third Metro in the top ten. David Llewellyn's co-driver Phil Short said, it's the first time I've done a stage down a river bed. Harold DeMuth was taming the full-blooded Quattro horsepower in 11th place. Despite earlier mishaps, Harry Toivenham was now 12th in his Metro. Five Metros in the first 12. Kenneth Eriksson is in the Guinness Book of Records for stunt driving in a car on two wheels. Here, he was on four. Lassie Lampy was 15th, despite a worrying differential problem. Mats Jonsson's previous best result was 10th in 83. Now he was 17th. The popular Penti Auricula in the Vauxhall Astra was lying 18th. Everyone is praising Louise Aitken Walker's performance. 19th in the big Nissan 2-4-0. Ladislav Krejcik was on song for Skoda's 14th consecutive class win here. Yorkshireman Chris Lord, laughing as always and in 22nd spot. Coidy Brennan, another story of water, water everywhere, with a major mud problem for the backmarkers, who are, of course, the backbone of the rally. Timo Salonen splashed through in 3 minutes 22 seconds, the fastest time he would share with Marco Alain. Ewa Kankanen had still not recovered from his Lakeland excursions and was 4 minutes behind Ericsson. stages been like for you this morning? They were okay for us and very, very difficult. There was fog, um, wet, rain. How tough is the fight up there at the top? Because there are only a few seconds splitting mm. the first few drivers. Well, they're still fighting and we're, and we're still fighting down where we are. <laughs> I wish we'd had the three minutes because we'd have been fighting with them. That's just, that's the problem. Yes. How much can you claw back now, do you think? Well, you can't really. Those, they're having a big fight, so they're, they're trying everything, and we can just about do their time, so there's no way we're going to climb back with them. 
We just want to stay ahead of the group that uh, we're playing with. So what would you hope for for the rest of the day? What sort of conditions? Well, I'd hope for a total disaster in the, in the Lance here in the Peugeot camp. <laughs> <laughs> Is it uh, true that you're the oldest competitor in this rally? Yes, at 57 years of age, Eddie and I are the oldest two competitors, and we've been together 31 years. Really? Yeah. Now, you're, uh, I mean, are you shaping up to it all right? Yes, you seem to be shaping up to it quite well. Do you find it tiring? Um, more hunger than tiring. And how's the car going? We've... We're having problems with the gearbox, but otherwise, fine. Uh, angling very well and going very well. And uh, can you give me any idea how much is the, uh, this, this car, how much does it cost you to prepare or anything? Well, it cost £250 uh, four years ago, but we spent a lot of hours on it and a lot of loving care. Anyway, you're enjoying it? Enjoying it very much indeed. Michael Sundstrom has already been picked to lead the British Peugeot team again next season. He was still in sixth place overall. Marco Elaine had certainly not given up hopes of victory. He matched Salon and speed on this stage. Tony Pond was now only 17 seconds behind the championship chasing Kankana. Kelly Grundle, in the sole surviving RS200, had the concentrated might of the entire Ford Service Army to help him. The cheerful Swede was determined to give them a top placing in return. Jimmy McRae was consistently amongst the top eight times. Harold DeMuth seemed to have cured an earlier engine misfire. Ingvar Carlsen had retaken the Group A lead from reputation. It is virtually the Kielder of Wales and would cause almost as many problems. World champion Timo Salonen could have lost the lead here. He spun and was 20 seconds slower than the fastest car. Fortunately for him, Marco Elaine was not the fastest Lancia here. That honour belonged to this man, Michael Eriksson, with a time of 15 minutes, 5 seconds. Kankanen was reported to be unwell with a suspected kidney stone problem. The championship chaser was certainly slower than in the earlier stages of the rally. But this stage belonged to Mickey Sundstrom in the Persia. It was a shattering performance. He was eight seconds faster than any other driver. Marco Elaine had possibly his worst stage of the day here. He was only fifth fastest, slow by the standards he had been setting, and would emerge from the forest 14 seconds behind Salonen. Tony Pond was determined to overhaul the slowing Kankanen and reported that the Metro really reveled in the slippery conditions. He was fourth fastest here and enjoying himself. <laughs> Callie Grundle could only manage tenth fastest time here. It seems a pity we won't see the RS200 on these rallies again, but there are going to be some very proud owners of the instantly rare production versions, but they won't be driving them like this. Jimmy McRae must have thought that some of these stages could have used his plumbing skills. The rain that caused flooding in many parts of Wales did nothing in to help his bid to overtake the Ford. Per Eklund's co-driver is Dave Whittock, who was heading to his hometown bar. If they maintain their ninth place, they could be sure of a liquid welcome tonight. David Llewellyn is no stranger to Dubby, but the conditions must have brought back memories of his spectacular accident in this year's Welsh Rally. 
he was 11th fastest here, enough to keep him in the top 10. <laughs> Kenneth Erickson was 14th fastest on this stage, and that was 13 seconds faster than his Group A rival, Lassie Lampy. Five seconds slower than the charging a lane on this second test. Mikhail Eriksson was simply storming along in his Lancia. He was joint equal fastest with his team leader, Elaine. Juha Kankanen was a full 19 seconds slower than the Lancia's here and was now back in fifth place. Michael Sundstrom was third fastest and was battling to overhaul Eriksson. Marco Elaine was, of course, trying to win the rally, but not at the risk of losing championship points. Tony Pond had to stop to change a wheel after a puncture. He lost three minutes and dropped to seven. Kelly Grundle was fighting gearbox problems, and he lost half a minute on the leaders. Jimmy McRae now had Tony Pond in his sights, and he was trying to get seventh spot. Bear Eklund, now ninth, told us he missed the night stages. There's just no pleasing everyone. Mikhail Eriksson may not be sure about his rallying future, but he has certainly done enough on this event to prove that he has patience as well as pace and would make a welcome addition to any works team. He was still third with only two stages to go. Juha Kankanen now had no hope of overhauling a lane, barring technical mishaps and it seems certain the championship will be decided at the Olympus Rally at Washington State in America in December. Timo Salonen could not have given his European Peugeot fans a better farewell present. He was 12 seconds ahead of Alain and seemed confident of a 10th World Championship win. Michael Sundstrom was certainly completing one of the finest drives of his career. Peugeot are expected to announce next week that he will sign for them again, possibly to lead the British Group A team. Marco Elaine may not have been leading the rally, but had done more than enough to keep the championship alive. If the position stayed the same at the finish, he would take over the title lead by just one point, 104 to 103. Callie Grundle once again proved the most successful Ford driver. Not only was he the only finisher in the RS200, but he was proved right in his diagnosis of faults in the gearbox. Once it was changed, he looked like adding a fifth place to his third in Sweden. Jimmy McRae was still more than happy with his Metro. He was lying eighth overall, but was not making any impression on Tony Pond. Tony Pond was naturally disappointed that punctures and differential problems had kept him from a top three placing. But he joked, I've enjoyed driving my Metro in this rally. I hope they'll let me keep it. Welsh farmer David Llewellyn had struggled with brake problems. 
He was disappointed he couldn't turn on a last-minute charge for his home fans, but simply dare not risk it. But a top ten place seemed well on the cards. Harold Demuth was coping with one of the most powerful Audi Quattros ever built, the last of the short wheelbase 450 horsepower models. Wistful rally watchers must have wondered just how well their own favourite Hanu Mikula would have fared. Kenneth Eriksson was driving the 16-valve Golf entered by the German company and demonstrated his horsepower supremacy over Volkswagen junior team winner Simon Davison. Ingvar Carlsen must have made Mazda feel very confident about their prospects for next season. With half the horsepower of the supercars, he was consistently in the top 15. And Lassie Lampy, despite struggling with a broken drive shaft earlier in the rally, had certainly demonstrated that the Group A Quattro Coupe could be a front runner in next year's rally championships. But at the top of the field, they were still battling it out to the bitter end. Poor Michael Sundstrom had to follow Peugeot team orders and let Juha Kankunen up into third place to help him in his world championship chase. Then Marco Alain made a dreadful mistake and chose the wrong tyres for this long stage in Rigos, leaving Timo Salonen, who had driven so superbly all through the rally, the winner. William Woolard was waiting for him at the finish. And uh, at the end of the street I can see the lead car which uh, has Timo Salonen, this year's winner of the Lombard RAC, making his way to the uh, finishing line. Can I give you a stick, Mike? Timo Salonen arrived at the start not only as the outgoing world champion, but also bidding farewell to the Peugeot team, for whom he has had two glorious years. Next season, he will probably be driving a Group A Master, so this was possibly the last chance to see him using the incredible 500 plus horsepower of the pace-setting Peugeot 205. Uh, the end of yet another Lombard RAC rally. Shorter this time, no uh, night stages. Many thought perhaps they might have taken too much out of the rally, but it proved yet again to be a rally of tremendous tension and drama. This is the final leaderboard. Uh, Timo Salonen there, a worthy winner. One minute, 22 seconds ahead of Marco Alen. Uh, Alen ahead of Kankinen, which is the position he wished to achieve, of course, to retain his position in the World Championship race. Michael Sundstrom, Really a very good position for him in fourth place. Cali Grun will bring the Ford up there to fifth. Tony Palm doing brilliantly to bring the Metro, his ailing Metro, into that sixth position. Well, there it is, the end of this. Another Lombard RAC rally. Uh, shorter, no night stages. Many people thought they'd taken too much out of it, but it proved again to be a rally of tremendous tension and drama. We still don't know who the world champion is, either Arlen or Kankanen. That remains to be decided. There's no doubt, however, who proved himself over the past four days to be a truly worthy champion, Timo Salon in the, uh, in the Peugeot. That's all from us, uh, from the finishing line here in Bath.
Marco Allen went to the United States with a one-point lead in the World Championship, earned with his second place in the RAC, and that controversial, still hotly disputed victory in San Remo, after the Peugeots had been excluded. The Finn, 35 years old, 13 victories in a long career at the top, but he'd never won the World Championship. Juha Kankanen had only risen to prominence last season. His third place on the RAC came after the disappointment of the San Remo disqualification, which could still be overruled. Kankanen, 26 years old, victories this season for him in Sweden, the Acropolis, and New Zealand, which shows the breadth covered by the World Championship. But for the decider, the championship was coming to the United States for the very first time. Starting point in Tacoma, Washington State, just a few miles from the home of the Seattle Seahawks. at the Tacoma Dome, there were problems for Alain and Lancia on the very first stage. The Lancia had lost power steering, and Alain, with the tension showing, even at this early stage, was clearly upset that there'd be no time to fix the problem before the two very long forest stages to come. De Duani ci ha detto che tu avevi un problema, dice, però lui non ha visto se si era rotto l'idroguida o se si era rotto il tubo, hai capito? Nini Russo, the team manager, tries to explain the problem, but Alain clearly isn't convinced. Alain had been six seconds quicker on the first spectator stage, but lost it all on the second. Kankinen, due to join Lancia next season, came across to express rather unconvincing sympathy. But his future teammate was finding it hard to remain calm. Kankinen headed off in the knowledge that there was a fair bit of time to be gained before the night was over. Alain followed, knowing that the first advantage was clearly with Kankinen. By the morning, though, with the rally heading west to the capital forests, fortunes had changed. Kankinen's Peugeot had an electrical problem. The mechanics changed the alternator, but not the battery. This had to be done on the run down to the first stage, and Kankinen lost a minute in the process. So the lead was back with Alain, who showed an instant change of mood and launched an immediate and spectacular attack to consolidate the position. Away from the battle for the championship, there was John Buffum, America's top rally driver, in the full specification Audi Sport Quattro, the car being seen in the world championship for the first time since Portugal. Toyota had booked their place on the Olympus, thinking there'd be an easy victory to pick up. The arrival of the battling Lancia and Peugeot put pay to that hope. But they were involved in an interesting contest with Lars Eric Torf, quicker than his illustrious teammate Bjorn Valdegar. 
The World Championship may have traveled thousands of miles to the west coast of America, but the rain and the terrain was all very similar to the Welsh forests of the RAC rally or the Thousand Lakes of Finland. This was one lake that slowed Kankanen a little, the icy water getting into the Peugeot's transmission, and the struggle up the muddy bank was a painful one. John Buffum in the Quattro was now slipping behind the pace set by the two flying fins ahead of him. And even further behind, the Toyotas, Lars Eric Torfo still leading his teammate Valdegar. Oakville service hall toward the end of the second day. Allen in the Lancia with a 40 second lead over Kankanen, who reflected on the electrical problem that had cost him the advantage. Yesterday we had this alternator problem and the battery was boiling. But they didn't change it yesterday, they, I think maybe forgot it. And they changed it this morning and it took so long time that we had to one minute roll panel. Very bad start to the day for you really. Yeah, but I mean, that can happen sometimes that maybe a driver do a mistake and maybe maybe serviceman so it's it's normal. You seem very philosophical about it. Yeah, I mean it's just a just a minute, it's not not end of the world. But it was a minute that could in the end decide the destiny of the world championship. The penultimate day and Allen driving as hard as he'd done in the whole of the world championship. He was now building on his lead. who'd started the Olympus as favourite for the event, favourite to take the title, had no problems with the Peugeot, but was struggling to beat Allen's pace. And Kankanen wasn't helped by a puncture, which would cost him another 45 seconds. of the field it was still the American John Buffum in third putting on a good show for an admittedly sparse crowd who were getting their first glimpse of world championship rallying. Buffum would finish in that third place but a massive 20 minutes behind the two pace setters. In fourth Lars Eric Torf was stretching his lead over Valdegard who was suffering a constant misfire in the second Toyota. Service at the end of the second day, Marco Allen still with a comfortable lead. But it was still proving a little difficult to bring a smile to the man apparently set for the world title. Marco, what was up? Fuck off, so they broke in last day. Oh dear. Oh. How much time did that lose you? I lost nine, nine seconds with you. Are. What's the gap now then, Marco? Maybe I lead him now one and a half minute. Oh well, that's that's a pretty good margin anyway. That's a pity, you know. I lost many, maybe more than ten. The final day and a change in the weather brought yet another apparent change of fortune. In the thick fog on the first stage, Allen appeared to lose his edge, and in the poor visibility, he also lost a bit of confidence in his pace notes. For a brief moment, it seemed that Kankinen had a chance, and he clawed back 40 seconds on this first stage of the day. At one stroke, Allen's lead had been halved, and there were another 10 stages to go before the finish. Kankinen put the advantage down to the fog, but that wouldn't last for too long. Marco said after that his notes was not really good, and it was foggy, and a lot of foggy, and, and also dark, so maybe and that make the difference, but we were a lot more quicker than he, and after that, the last three stages, we have made the same time, so it's... What is the gap now, then? It's 56 seconds or something like that. Do you think you can catch him today? Ah, oh, it's difficult to say. I mean, by driving, it's it's going to be very hard, but you will, you never know. I mean, it's one puncture or something like that, and like we had yesterday, we lost 45 on that puncture, so it's not... Everything is not gone yet.
But by the final stage of the rally, Kankinen had made no further impression. Alain, despite driving on worn tyres, had matched the Peugeot for pace right through the day. For Kankinen driving hard, it had been disappointment and frustration all the way. The minute that he'd lost with the electrical problem and then that puncture had ultimately cost him the rally and the world championship. Lancia may have conceded the Constructors' title to Peugeot three rounds ago, but they'd now claimed the World Drivers' Championship for Finland's Marco Alen. Alen, who'd been among the best for the last ten years, was long overdue for the title, and the apparently ice-cool Finn became typically Italian as the celebrations began in the Lancia service area. Wonderful! <laughs> The celebrations may come to an abrupt halt if FISA now overturn the result of San Remo because that would give the title to Kankinen. But for now, Alain was enjoying being world champion. Many congratulations. Thank you. Will you talk to us now? Well, uh, obviously. What I tell for you in uh, Air I see, you know, in, I am uh, now super happy. You remember what I say? Yes, you I did. am not in well champion. I am happy. And now you know, and I am well champion. I am super happy, absolutely.